Hello once again. Uh, I am Eric Coleman. I serve as a state senator from the second senatorial district in the state of Connecticut. And that district includes the city of Hartford and the towns of Windsor and Bloomfield. I'm also very privileged to be your host for the next half hour. I want to thank you so much for viewing. And today, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the budget process in the state of Connecticut. On February 18th in the year 2015, uh, Connecticut Governor Dan O'Malloy uh, gave his budget address, and that address officially starts the budget processing in uh, the Connecticut legislature and Connecticut state government. Uh, from there, uh, the Appropriations Committee, which is the legislature's budget committee, uh, will review uh, what the governor has to say uh, and what appropriations the governor has recommended. And they will fine tune that, uh, put in a little flavor of their own and present a budget for approval. Uh, certainly after some negotiation with the governor's office, they'll present a budget uh, for the final approval by the House of Representatives and the State Senate. But I want to talk a little bit uh, during this program about uh, what the governor had to say yesterday. And I don't so much want to focus on the numbers and the dollars, uh, although I think it is significant that uh, the um, uh, effort um, on the part of the legislature and the governor is to address a uh, significant uh, budget deficit. In fact, the $2.5 billion uh, budget deficit. And so uh, the process started on February 18th with the governor's address. I wanna chat a little bit about what he said. Um, and again, as I said, not focusing so much on the dollars and the numbers, but uh, the uh, policies and the initiatives that he sought to finance uh, with his budget. And those were uh, some fairly broad and uh, I would dare say popular themes. Uh, he talked about uh, education uh, and public schools. Uh, he talked about aid to municipalities. Uh, and then there were two uh, very specialized uh, themes that he mentioned uh, during his address to the General Assembly uh, on the opening day uh, of the 2015 legislative session. And those two initiatives had to do with transportation, a big initiative of his. This is the year of transportation as far as the governor's office is concerned. And he also talked about a second chance society initiative. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, both of those subjects uh, as we get into the program. But what, what did the governor touch upon? Um, he indicated that he was committed to uh, funding public education and to maintain the current levels of funding uh, the main formula for funding public schools in the state of Connecticut is the education cost sharing formula. And, um, and at least um, according to the governor's talk on February 18th, he's representing that uh, all of the school districts should expect to maintain the same level of funding that they enjoyed in the previous fiscal year. And I had some discussion yesterday with uh, some of the advocates for education, uh, particularly public school education. And they were a little bit disappointed because they uh, noted 
that there were significant increases in funding for magnet schools and funding for charter schools. Um, and the governor didn't necessarily go into any great detail or address uh, those two areas in his talk on the 18th. Um, but he made a big deal about maintaining uh, current funding uh, under ECS, which was somewhat of a relief to some people because given the, uh, the depth of our deficit or the magnitude of our deficit, um, everybody was anticipating uh, that there would be significant cuts across the board, including the education and aid to municipalities. Uh, but uh, the intention is on the part of the governor to maintain current level funding. And as I indicate, there are some public school advocates who are disappointed in that because of um, the uh, concurrent increases in funding for uh, magnet schools and uh, charter schools. The other area uh, of the budget that the governor uh, spoke about on the 18th had to do with municipal government. Um, he made um, he made some bold statements, um, pledging uh, that no police officer or firefighter or teacher uh, would be laid off or be put out of work uh, as a result of the state's failure. Uh, to do its part in terms of providing significant funding for uh, municipalities. One of the um, big components of his budget has to do with uh, a sales tax overall. He's um, uh, intending to uh, reduce the state sales tax. Um, current state sales tax is about uh, 6.5, 6.6%, and he's proposing to reduce that uh, rate down to 6.2%. But at the same time, he's also uh, eliminating some exemptions or some items that had been heretofore exempt from the sales tax would now be included and subject uh, to sales tax. Um, some of those items include, uh, for example, the elimination of the exemption on children's clothing. Um, and that was an exemption that uh, many parents of students, school aid students uh, took advantage of, um, particularly uh, during the period of time right before uh, schools opened up. Uh, when parents could buy clothing, um, school outfits, uh, for their youngsters without um, having those purchases be subject to the state sales tax. Uh, in reducing the state sales tax and overhauling the sales tax, uh, obviously uh, there have got to be some increases uh, somewhere in order to uh, uh, balance out the generation of revenues uh, for the state budget. And so what he's proposed in very general terms is to close some of the loopholes that uh, many of the uh, major corporations and some of the wealthier players in the state have been able to take advantage of uh, in avoiding uh, the payment of uh, significant taxes. Um, he wants, uh, that is the governor wants, um, the whole budget process to be guided by uh, about four separate principles. Uh, first of all, he doesn't want uh, the budget to violate the spending cap. He wants to stay within the um, statutory and constitutional uh, spending cap that the state of Connecticut is subject to. Uh, he also expresses that he doesn't want the budget to be balanced on the backs of the poor and the disadvantaged and vulnerable populations uh, in the state of Connecticut. And third and fourth, he doesn't want uh, any of the spending proposals to
put schools in jeopardy uh, or municipalities in jeopardy. He's also talked uh, a little bit about um, employment and training in the state of Connecticut. And uh, he pointed with pride to the fact that the unemployment rate, which had been at 9.1% um, uh, when he took office, uh, is now down to 6.4%. And he's indicated that 75,000 jobs had been created uh, uh, since he's been in office. And 94% of the jobs that were lost uh, during the recession uh, have now been restored. Uh, a, a provision in his uh, budget, which drew a lot of applause from legislators, uh, was his proposal to eliminate the business entity tax. And um, that tax is uh, it's about $250 um, assessed against every business in the state of Connecticut and sometimes found to be onerous, particularly for small businesses uh, in the state. Uh, but he's proposed the elimination uh, of that particular tax. And at the same time, uh, continuing his effort to try and assist uh, small businesses, uh, he's indicated he wants to continue uh, and even expand upon the Small Business Ex Express program, which is a program that's administered, administered by the Department of Economic and Community Development and provides for financing uh, in the form of loans and grants and loan guarantees for uh, small businesses in the state of Connecticut. Uh, he's indicated that the support for schools, the state's support for schools uh, is important and with that, he wants to uh, continue uh, to build a workforce uh, that will benefit the economy here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, another goal is to close the achievement gap. Uh, he wants to uh, refinance student loans so that uh, those students who have pursued higher education and are in debt because of that pursuit, uh, will find some relief um, from the overly burdensome loans uh, that they are required to repay uh, after their uh, higher education experience has concluded. Uh, he's also talked about uh, continuing uh, the state's effort uh, to reach children at the earliest possible moment. Um, there's been, uh, for the past few years now, uh, a very direct initiative uh, in the area of uh, early childhood education. And in keeping with that and remaining consistent with that, he wants to expand um, the all day kindergarten uh, effort that was started uh, and now may be in the majority of the uh, school districts in the state but he wants to make um, the opportunity for all day kindergarten experiences uh, universal for every school district uh, in the state of Connecticut. And so um, the process has begun. Uh, the governor has um, laid down his blueprint. And as I indicated, there'll be some fine tuning uh, and some um, uh, probably ideas and proposals and initiatives that will be added by the members of the Appropriations Committee and the other legislative leaders. Um, it's oftentimes a very messy process, but um, I think there's good reason to be optimistic that uh, those matters and those uh, uh, areas that we deem to be important, such as public schools and uh, municipalities, uh, will receive a sufficient amount of support uh, in order to operate effectively in the next fiscal year. 
the budget uh, will total about $18 billion uh, in fiscal year 16 and 18.55 billion in fiscal year 17. And that's down a bit uh, from uh, the previous fiscal year's budget, which was about a total of $20 billion. And so at this point, um, I'd suggest we take a break and when we come back, we'll talk about the two major components, uh, policy components of the governor's budget and that has to do with transportation and the criminal justice initiative, which he refers to as uh, the Second Chance Society. So uh, we'll take a break right now. And when we come back, we'll discuss a little bit more about uh, Connecticut Governor Daniel P. Malloy's uh, budget proposals, which he presented to the General Assembly on February 18th, 2015. Black History Month, we pause to acknowledge and appreciate contributions enriching our cultural and intellectual fabric. Keep it coming. We are the members of the Third Day Rocks and Dance Theater, and we celebrate Black History 365 days of the year. Hi, welcome back. And again, thank you for viewing uh, this segment of the Senate reports. I am Eric Coleman, the state senator from the second senatorial district in the state of Connecticut. And I'm so pleased that you could uh, share uh, this time with us. And uh, I'm always um, grateful for the opportunity to speak to you about some issues of importance regarding the communities in the district that I represent and issues of importance uh, statewide here in the state of Connecticut. So we left off, we talked a little bit about Governor Malloy's uh, budget proposals, and I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about uh, his criminal justice initiative, uh, which he refers to as uh, the second chance proposal or the second chance society. And his, uh, his initiative comes as a result of the recognition that um, we have to do more uh, in terms of uh, re-entry and we have to do more in terms of um, providing opportunities for uh, people who have offended uh, but want to become productive citizens uh, in our communities and in the state of Connecticut. And so, uh, he's proposed um, the theme of uh, moving away from permanent punishment and instead uh, putting a greater emphasis on rehabilitation and opportunities for ex-offenders. And he feels that uh, one of the ways, one of the significant ways in which that we can do this is to provide our judges a greater discretion, and particularly when it comes uh, to avoiding mandatory minimum sentences, um, especially in connection with a conviction, uh, a conviction for uh, nonviolent drug offenses. Um, For a long time, many people have felt that mandatory minimum sentences were counterproductive. And um, being an attorney, I've been in courtrooms uh, a number of, on a number of occasions when judges have publicly expressed uh, from the bench that they wish that they, they had an alternative, but um, they're required to follow a statute which provides for a mandatory minimum sentence. Um, and so uh, I think Governor Malloy is to be commended for his foresight in um, providing uh, or affording judges uh, a considerable amount of discretion um, in this proposal, uh, which he's calling Second Chance Society. Uh, he also 
um, recognizes that um, we have to do something significant about recidivism. And um, those people who do not recognize that there is some, cor some correlation between the lack of opportunity or denial of opportunity uh, and recidivism uh, are actually burying their heads in the sand. Um, it is uh, very apparent uh, that to the extent that people who are trying to uh, re-enter society um, will fail at that effort, no matter how well-intended they are, uh, if they don't have an opportunity to support themselves, earn an income, support themselves, and su to support their families, uh, they will uh, re-offend unless such opportunities are granted. So in recognition of that, um, Governor Malloy is proposing to uh, put a significant amount of money towards uh, good jobs and job opportunities, as well as uh, for housing and supportive services uh, for people who are uh, very interested in becoming uh, good citizens and re-entering the community. Uh, additionally, uh, another aspect of his proposal has to do with the streamlining of the pardon process and the parole process. Uh, both of those processes are sort of mystifying to uh, a lot of people who petition that process. And um, I think uh, uh, it is important to have some sort of transparency and some sort of comprehension of those processes, which uh, apparently Governor Malloy agrees with. So he's proposed to uh, make the pardon process a little bit more easy and uh, understandable, and as well uh, to provide uh, affirmative notice to um, inmates who are becoming eligible for parole uh, so that they may uh, enter that process um, at the earliest possible time. And finally, um, uh, the piece that may be a little bit more controversial than any of the others that I've uh, mentioned uh, to this point is his proposal to reclassify uh, nonviolent drug offenses uh, from felonies uh, to misdemeanors. And um, probably not so controversial when we're talking about marijuana, but his proposal extends to uh, narcotics, um, whether it be cocaine or heroin or uh, hallucinogenics. Um, his proposal would not apply to instances where uh, drugs are being sold, but for mere possession of any of the drugs that I've mentioned and others, uh, there would not be uh, a possibility of a felony conviction on the record of a person who was merely possessing those drugs. Uh, the most that would happen would be a misdemeanor conviction. And so we'll stay tuned to see how um, the Second Chance Society proposal fares in the legislative process and if implemented, how it fares uh, in society in general. The other major uh, piece that the governor talked about was uh, transportation. And uh, those of you who paid any attention to uh, his address at the opening of the General Assembly session, uh, know that he came out uh, out of the box uh, talking about uh, wanting to do some major things as far as transportation is concerned. And he talked on the 18th of February about some specific projects. Um, he talked in Hartford about um, the work to be done on the I-84 viaduct in Hartford, as well as uh, the Charter Oak Bridge. Uh, he was proposing um, 
in upgrading of the Charter Oak Bridge and all told, um, he said that there was approximately $860 million in economic activity that would be generated as a result of work in Hartford on those two projects alone. Uh, in Middletown, he was proposing um, renovations to Route 9 that would make um, access to the riverfront easier. In Waterbury, I guess that there's an intersection that's referred to as the Mix Master. Uh, he wants to replace uh, the Mix Master. And in Danbury, uh, he's proposing work to be done on I-84 between exits three and eight uh, for the purpose of relieving congestion uh, on I-84 in Danbury. And when we talk about uh, congestion on the highways, uh, I suppose Fairfield County is the poster child for highway congestion. Uh, it's been a long standing problem and he's proposing to address that problem uh, with work done on I-95 between Greenwich and Bridgeport and also um, with work being proposed for uh, the Merritt Parkway interchange. In Eastern Connecticut, uh, again, he's talking about um, improvements to I-95 uh, from Old Saybrook to New London. Um, in the New Haven area, he wants to uh, widen I-95 and interchange to I-395. And that's um, what he's proposing as far as the highways and, and the uh, major thoroughfares in Connecticut are concerned. But he also wants to address the other modes of transportation, for example, the railways and the busways. And uh, as far as the railways are concerned, uh, he wants to finish stations up and down the New Haven Springfield line. Um, and he wants to expand commuter rail service uh, to accommodate places like Enfield and Hamden. Uh, he's proposing to finish uh, the um, Springfield, or from Windsor to Spring, to finish the, the uh, Springfield, um, the Hartford, the Springfield line um, from Windsor to uh, Springfield. And in New Haven, he's proposing uh, to complete the parking garage projects uh, and the walkover bridge uh, in New Haven. Similar improvements are being proposed uh, for Waterbury. Um, and he's also proposing, uh, as far as the buses are concerned, um, he wants to begin with a study um, for new and alternative routes um, where service is currently lacking. Uh, and he wants to pay some attention um, to new bridge uh, renovation and upgrading, uh, as well as some focus of attention on the walking trails and the bikeways in the state of Connecticut. He's referring to his transportation proposal, uh, which is fairly comp comprehensive. Uh, he's calling it the five-year ramp up. And uh, to conclude um, the 10-year, um, approximately 10-year effort um, to upgrade transportation systems in the state, he's convening a nonpartisan commission to recommend ways uh, to sustain uh, the transportation system uh, in the state of Connecticut. And so, uh, as I've indicated, the budget process has begun. Um, the governor is making some fairly bold uh, recommendations and proposals. Uh, we'll see what the Appropriations Committee does uh, with those proposals. Um, and uh, 
uh, sometime about June, I expect that the General Assembly will approve a budget uh, that will carry us through fiscal year 16, 2016 and fiscal year 2017. Um, I'm hopeful and I think others are optimistic uh, that the state of Connecticut uh, will be enabled to effectively manage its programs and services uh, and that the citizens of the state um, will be all the better for it. As always, budgeting is a challenge, um, but I think the guiding principles that the governor has laid out, particularly the principle about not balancing the budget on the backs of the poor and the disadvantaged, the elderly, and the other vulnerable populations in the state are um, good principles to be guided by. Um, so we are in pursuit of uh, effective uh, fiscal policy uh, and balancing that with uh, attention and care uh, for all of the residents and citizens of the state of Connecticut. So with that, uh, let me sign off by just thanking you again for viewing the program. And I hope that you'll continue to turn in, tune in to uh, the Senate reports. This is Eric Coleman, state senator from the second senatorial district in Connecticut, proudly representing the communities of Hartford, Bloomfield, and Windsor. I'll see you next time.